Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 123, Your Official God versus Your Actual God. I have to start this episode with an apology. In the last episode, I said it would be my last comment for a while on the One God controversy at Wheaton. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help myself. I just found that I had more to say about it, and I read a couple of stimulating things from two other philosophers, which I'm going to comment on in this episode, and one of them stimulated me to think about the whole issue from a different angle. So I hope you'll find it really interesting. If you don't know what controversy I'm talking about, you might want to go back and look at a few blog posts at trinities.org. This has to do with the Wheaton College professor, Dr. Larisha Hawkins, who said that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. And this has caused a firestorm of protest for many evangelicals. And many Christian philosophers, many of them evangelicals as well, have also weighed in. And a lot of them have a different perspective than some of the other commentary. In the last episode, I distinguished three different questions. One question is, Are Muslims referring to the same being that Christians are referring to? That's what I call the reference question. Then we can ask, are they worshiping the same being? And this is ambiguous because worship can be something just that we do. It just involves our own mental states, our own attitudes, our own personal actions. Or worship could imply that what the humans are offering is actually received by God. If Muslims and Christians are referring to the same being, then they're clearly worshiping the same being in the first sense, that they're both directing their worship at the same God. But that by itself doesn't imply that God is equally pleased by both acts of worship or that he accepts both acts of worship in general. Then there's a question of what I call naive pluralism. If to say that Christians and Muslims worship the same God is to say that there aren't any important theological differences between Christianity and Islam, Well, that's super controversial, but that's not something that the Wheaton professor had said, and it's not something that most traditional Christians would say. It is something that a lot of American evangelicals are hypersensitive to, and they kind of, I think, imagine it being said even when it's not being said. I was really happy to receive a piece of feedback on the previous episode, and this was through LinkedIn where I had posted it, and the feedback is actually from my own uncle. His name is Leonard Tuggy. He's my father's older half-brother, and he spent his entire career either being a missionary or working in support of missionaries for a certain evangelical denomination. His feedback is as follows, quote, I agree with Dale. Once a Pakistani Muslim was talking with me about God who created the world. When he was talking about the Creator God, he was referring to the same Creator God that I, as a Christian, believe in. If I had talked with him about God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he would have said that he did not believe that God is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would be disagreeing with what I believe about God, not that we were referring to two different beings. Also, I used to visit Indonesia, where I found that in the Indonesian Bible, the word for God is Allah. End quote. I think that my Uncle Leonard's perspective on this is very commonly held in the missionary world, and I think it's the more typical perspective in the older generation of evangelicals. Of course, they have no interest in all in saying that evangelical Christianity and Islam completely agree about God or that there aren't any important differences between the two. No, they're missionaries. They're trying to convert people. This is something, though, that they think they have in common with the Muslim hey, we are talking about the same being, but they're urging that God sent Jesus to save the world, that Jesus is the best revealer of God, and so on. They're using this common element with Islam that they're referring to the same being that Christians are referring to. They're using that as a bridge, as a handle, as something to get a grip on to start the conversation. This is no compromise with popular pluralism of some sort. Nor is it flattering or whitewashing Islam in any way, as many evangelical Americans often complain about the media doing these days, and with some good reason. A lot of the evangelical commentary that I've read by non-philosophers, and I don't really want to name names here, there's a sense of offense. There's a sense of anger underlying it all. I really see a lot of the commentary as a product of culture war struggles. 
They feel that somehow Muslims or pluralistic non-Christians are pushing their will on them and they're going to push back and say, no, you can't do that. It's a culture war fight. As to the distinctions that philosophers have made about different ways to interpret this statement that Christians and Muslims worship the same God, generally speaking, they just want to say no, don't want to get into subtleties, don't want to get into logic chopping, just no, no, no. And the reason for no is there are all these important differences between Christian and Islamic theology. And so they then just spend the rest of the editorial just hammering those differences, Trinity, Incarnation being the two big ones. I really think this is wrong-headed, and I think it's missing an opportunity to make some important distinctions and to think carefully through some of these issues. So a lot of the comments that I've seen forwarded around on Facebook and other social media by evangelicals, I find pretty disappointing. What's disappointing is that people's passions seem to be trumping their minds. They're not interested so much in the truth of the matter, but they're interested in sticking their finger in the eye of the opposition. Someone else who's noticed this is someone who's not an evangelical Christian. It's Dr. Edward Fazer, the well-known Roman Catholic philosopher and excellent writer. And he blogs at edwardfazer.blogspot.com. In a post on January 15th entitled, Islam, Christianity, and Liberalism Again, he really kind of takes the words out of my mouth and he makes a good point about the enmity that's behind some of the commentary from evangelicals. In part, Dr. Fazer says this, quote, in my recent post on the debate about whether Christians and Muslims worship the same God, I made it clear that all I was there addressing was the philosophical question of whether Christians and Muslims succeed in referring to one and the same thing when they use the word God. In other words, I was discussing an issue in the philosophy of language. That's it. In response, lots of people wanted to get into a debate about the merits of Islam as a religion, the consequences of Muslim immigration into Western countries, universal salvation, political correctness, etc., all of that is simply irrelevant. Someone could take an extremely negative attitude about Islam and still agree, consistently with that, that Christians and Muslims are, despite their deep disagreements about the divine nature, referring to the same thing when they use the word God. Skipping a bit, Fazer continues, Really, the point isn't difficult to see. It seems that one of the things some readers get hung up on, though, is the word worship. They seem to think that if you say that Christians and Muslims worship the same God, then you are insinuating that Christianity and Islam are both salvific, or that the differences between Christian and Muslim theology and ethics are not very important, or something along those lines. But none of that follows at all. To worship something as divine is to acknowledge that it has the highest possible status or dignity, and consequently to give it the highest reverence, devotion, or adoration. To say that Christians and Muslims worship the same God is merely to note what follows from the facts that they a. refer to the same being when they use the word God, and b. They both worship that to which they refer. Nothing at all follows about whether Muslim worship is sufficient for salvation, whether it is mixed with egregious theological and moral errors, etc. Why any Christian would find this mysterious or puzzling, I have no idea, because the New Testament itself makes it clear that it is possible for a person to worship the true God and still be so deep in theological and moral error that his salvation is in jeopardy. For example, in chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel, Christ quotes Isaiah against the Pharisees, saying, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. He doesn't say, Well, since you are a brood of vipers and a bunch of whited sepulchers, you don't really worship the true God at all. Rather, he says that even though they do worship the true God, their worship is in vain, because of their grave moral defects. So there is simply no necessary connection at all between, on the one hand, saying that Christians and Muslims worship the same God, and on the other hand, taking a politically correct attitude toward Islam, affirming universal salvation, etc. Some people have such difficulty seeing the point, or even acknowledging, much less answering the arguments for it, that it is hard to avoid the conclusion that their thinking here, or lack thereof, is driven by non-rational factors. It's pretty clear with some of them that their hatred of Islam is so visceral that they desperately want it to be the case that Allah is the name of some demon, pagan god, or idol. This is intellectually dishonest, pointless, and harmful. It is intellectually dishonest because it simply isn't true to the facts. It is pointless because acknowledging that Christians and Muslims worship the same god in no way would ever commits one to political correctness, to universal salvation, or theological liberalism, to taking a positive view of Islam, etc., 
And it is harmful because it gives aid and comfort to those who want to shut down even the most sober and dispassionate critical thinking about Islam by shouting, bigot, end quote. Fazer goes on to make many other interesting points and interesting comments, but I'll leave you to read that. I've got the link to his post at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. When the Trinities podcast returns, another well-known Christian philosopher weighs in on the no side. The second piece that really got me thinking more about this topic is by a philosopher named Dr. Lydia McGrew. Dr. McGrew has a PhD in English literature, but most people think of her as a philosopher because she has a very distinguished record of publication in theory of knowledge, that is epistemology, and also in philosophy of religion. She's not a professor, she's a homeschooling mom and a blogger, but I wouldn't call her an amateur philosopher just because she's not a professor. She's a very talented philosopher. She blogs at What's Wrong With The World, which is at What's Wrong With The World.net, and also at her own blog called Extra Thoughts, which is at Lydia's webpage.blogspot.com. She published a piece at thegospelcoalition.org, and it's entitled The Same God Debate Is Too Important to Leave to Philosophers. One thing that's strange about the piece is her kind of cranky disdain for philosophers getting themselves involved in the controversy. She refers to philosophers as self-styled specialists on the issue, and she suggests that this is the kind of thing that any informed Christian can judge. Well, sure, I think some of those questions have answers that are pretty clear, but what's a little strange is that, like a lot of the commenters from evangelicalism who are not philosophers, they hear the statement that Christians and Muslims worship the same God, and they assume they know what's meant by that, and then they immediately just start bashing it. Oh, it's obviously false. Obviously, they're saying there are no important differences between Christian and Islam, but there are. Well, Dr. McGrew knows the difference between the reference question and two different interpretations of the worship question. These would be easy things for her to understand. And she knows that those are three different questions from the question of what I called last time naive pluralism, the idea that there aren't any important differences. But even knowing all this, she starts off this commentary as if what the statement means is just super clear, and obviously the answer is no. In her third paragraph, she says, quote, Given the fundamental differences between the Muslim and Christian concepts of God, it would be surprising if there existed some knockdown philosophical argument that both groups worship the same God. An intelligent non-philosopher could reasonably conclude instead that any theory leading to that conclusion must be incorrect. End quote. Right, but what is the claim? The Christian view is that this isn't about two fictional characters, one fictional character named Allah and another fictional character named Yahweh. If that's all it was about, then we may not really care whether it's the same character or different, or we might just say that we can only ask if there are significant or important differences between the two characters, and then we'll say that they're different characters. But it's not that simple, because Christians think that Yahweh is more than a fictional character, so it's a real question whether or not he's being referred to under the name Allah by some people. Well, clearly he is. He's being referred to as Allah by Arabic-speaking Christians. The question is, are Muslims referring to that same God? She continues, quote, One argument goes something like this. It's possible for two people to have radically different ideas about someone, but still be referring to the same person. Someone who talks to Superman is talking to the same person a co-worker of Clark Kent talks to, though the latter has no notion of Kent's superhero identity. In the same way, Muslims and Christians have different ideas about God, but nonetheless worship the same God. But this argument is question-begging. The analogy assumes there is one being, the same being with whom Muslims and Christians are both in contact, even if they don't realize it. End quote. My response is that's not a complete standalone argument. A fuller argument would make the point that Christians and Muslims are both in contact with God because God has revealed himself to all humans, potentially by way of general revelation. And so they have an idea of a creator and arguably can interact with God in prayer, even arguably while having pretty mistaken ideas about God, like most people do. 
I take it that the point of the Clark Kent Superman example is not to establish that Christians and Muslims are referring to the same being, but just to give a rebuttal to the oversimple argument that official Christian and Muslim theologies differ significantly about God, and so they can't possibly be referring to the same being. Well, the Superman example shows, as she agrees, that two people can be referring to the same being, even when one is very mistaken about important properties of that being, even mistaken about essential properties of that being. She says, quote, At most, the Clark Kent Superman analogy shows that there are possible situations in which persons can have radically different ideas about someone with whom they are both in contact. In some cases, radically different ideas may still mean the two persons are referring to the same being, but in other cases they will not. It's not a trivial thing to conclude two groups are referring to the same entity when there's plenty of reason otherwise. Skipping a bit, she continues, Christians presumably don't believe most Muslims, when praying to Allah, are experiencing real contact with the one true God. And Christians definitely shouldn't believe Muhammad had a genuine encounter with God that led him to found Islam. End quote. Well, that latter point is, I think, indisputable. There have been very few Christians who are willing to concede that Muhammad really did experience revelation from the one God. But the first question isn't nearly so obvious. Is it obvious that there aren't any Muslims that pray to Allah and God accepts their prayer or receives their prayer in some sense? What if they're praying to Allah and saying, should I believe in Jesus? Should I believe what these Christian missionaries are telling me? Why couldn't a person be a Muslim praying to Allah like that and be experiencing real contact with the one true God? It's not obvious that they don't. Now, I think some Christians might assume that God just hates the whole Islamic tradition and finds it offensive because he didn't start it and he doesn't agree with most of it, or at least with a lot of it. And so God is just going to veto anybody who's trying to reach out to him from within that tradition. Really? Is he that harsh? Christians may feel comfortable assuming that God is that harsh, but... I don't know. I think that sounds like a bit much. If God looks on the heart, it seems that whether or not they have true repentance is going to matter both for a Christian and for a Muslim. You might be in the right tradition, and God may reject your prayers. Arguably, you could be in a wrong tradition, and God could accept your prayers, particularly in a circumstance like I just described. Right? Dr. McGrew continues, quote, Here's another common argument. Muslims claim to worship the God who spoke to Abraham, as told in the Bible. Christians and Jews also claim to worship the God who spoke to Abraham in the Bible stories. Therefore, they're all worshiping the same God, since they're all referring to the God of Abraham. But this argument depends on such a thin notion of worshiping the same God that it leads to absurd conclusions. Suppose I invent a religion according to which I, Lydia McGrew, am identical to the one who made special revelations to Abraham, as told in the biblical stories. And my sincere followers sincerely think they are worshiping the God of Abraham when they worship me. Does that mean Lydians, Christians, and Jews all worship the same God? Such a theory trivializes all differences among religions, and any intelligent non-philosopher is free to reject it out of hand and go on believing Christians and Muslims don't worship the same God. End quote. This is the part that really got me thinking. I had given an example in my second episode with Dr. William Valicella in discussing this about a cult leader in Australia who claims to be the reincarnation of none other than Jesus Christ. And it seems to me that the people who follow this cult leader are coming up with false beliefs not only about the cult leader, like that he's the same person as Jesus, they're also coming up with false beliefs about Jesus, like that Jesus took a rebirth in Australia in the 20th century. I think it's a case of mistaken identity, and I think, for instance, if they believe that this cult leader is wise, they're actually referring to two beings, to the guy, whatever his name is, the Australian man, and also to Jesus. Why? Because they're identifying the two in their minds, incorrectly, of course. Now, if I put my faith and trust in Jesus, and these people put their faith and trust in this cult leader, are they also putting their faith in Jesus? Well, they're referring to the same being. He's one of the ones they're referring to. They're also referring to the imposter Jesus guy. But I wouldn't suggest that this is a good religious belief or religious practice. 
this guy is not going to turn out to be a reliable guide to what Jesus really wants. What about Dr. McGrew's thought experiment then? They believe that Lydia is the God of Abraham and they worship Lydia. Are they worshiping the same God as Christians? Well, they're referring to the same God as Christians. They're worshiping the same God as Christians if worship only has to do with the person. Why? Because they're referring to God. They're also referring to Lydia. They're mistakenly supposing that those two are the same being. Again, she says, quote, such a theory trivializes all differences among religions, end quote. No, no, it doesn't. If you thought that that trivialized the difference between the Lydians, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, well, I don't grant that, but supposing it did, it wouldn't be trivializing all differences among religions. There still might be very significant differences between those four religions and Sikhism, Hinduism, Buddhism, various kinds of native people's religions, and so on. So no kind of far-reaching pluralism follows. All that follows is that Lydians, Muslims, Christians, and Jews are referring to the God of Abraham. And in a sense, they're worshiping the same being. Not that that worship is effective, not that God is equally pleased with it in all cases, and not that their theologies are the same in all important respects. Clearly they're not. Clearly you're making an enormous mistake if you worship Dr. Lydia McGrew. I do think that she's really on to something here, and this is the point that really got me thinking. What do we mean by calling something your God? We might mean who you consider to be God. That's one thing we might mean by talking about your God. But here's another thing we might mean by your God. We might mean the being who actually rules over you. We might mean by your God, the one whose will you to a large extent follow. Now, what about the Lydians that worship Lydia on the mistaken assumption that she is the God of Abraham? If you look at their actual lives, who's going to be the one ruling over them? If Lydia McGrew is like most cult leaders, she will be their God. They'll be doing what she wants them to do. It'll be about enhancing her power, her money, and so on. Consider the followers of this fake Jesus in Australia. Who is their God in the sense of the one who actually rules over them, the one whose will is done in their lives? Well, it's the cult leader. It's not Jesus. Jesus and the cult leader do not agree. And the cult leader and God do not agree. So even though they're referring to Jesus... Jesus isn't ruling over them. Jesus is not their Lord, not their God in that sense. But the point doesn't just apply to strange cults, New Age groups, and hypothetical religions like Dr. McGrew was discussing in her thought experiment. The point also applies to actual religions. Have you ever heard of the Christian identity movements? These are basically nutty, racist offshoots of Christianity. A typical belief they have, which is foundational to the religion, is that white people are descended from Adam and Eve, and other people are in some sense the spawn of Satan. And so God only loves white people. Only white people are God's chosen. Current day Jews really aren't God's chosen people. It's really the white people that are God's chosen people. So you have just a kind of insane racial bigotry, which goes contrary to the gospel. Now, are they referring to the Christian God? Yes, they are. As I understand it, many of them are basically Trinitarian and pretty much mainstream in their core theology and Christology. They believe in the doctrine of two natures, incarnation, and that there's a tripersonal God. If you say, well, they're not worshiping my God because my God is not a racist. My God does not only love white people. Well, what you really mean to say is they have some very bad mistakes some very harmful, important errors in their beliefs about God. But they are talking about your God, right? They're talking about some other God. Still, you can ask, who is their God in the sense of ruling over them? Who is it whose will they're actually doing? Well, I don't know, but it's not God. They're doing the will of the, the crazy bigots who urge them on. Many Christians would be inclined to think that they're doing the will of some demonic forces. And all the while, some of these people are praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven... May your kingdom come, may your will be done. But in many respects, it's not God's will that's being done in these Christian identity movements. So there are many actual situations in which your official God is not your actual God. But the point also applies to more mainstream Christians. 
Maybe you go to, I don't know, a Catholic church or a mainstream Protestant church, but all your actual beliefs and values come from contemporary secular leftism. Who's your God? Whose will are you actually doing? It may not be God's. It might be someone else's, even though God is your official God. Your theological beliefs are about God, but he's not functioning as your God, at least to a large extent. Someone else is, or maybe multiple other beings are. Dr. Fazer, in a passage that I quoted a little while ago, gave, I think, a great example of there being a difference between one's official God and one's actual God, which was some things that Jesus says in the Gospels about the Pharisees. At some points, he says that their father is the devil. Of course, they're Jews. They don't worship the devil. Their official God is God. And yet, whose will are they doing? Remember also that in one place, Paul calls Satan the God of this world. That means in the fallen human natural order, to a large extent, it's Satan's will that's done in the world. And people are unknowingly making him their God by doing the kind of things that he wants done. When I thought about the example of the shameful Christian identity movements, it made me think of these two passages from the second and third chapters of the first letter of John. The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light, and in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates another believer is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go, because the darkness has brought on blindness. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin, because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin, because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. John, of course, is focusing on Christian problems, problems that are wholly within the Christian realm, that don't deal with people who officially are members of some other religion. He's saying to Christians, if you hate and don't love your brother and sister, you're still in darkness. You haven't actually aligned yourself with God's will. God may be the one to whom you refer your worship, and yet you're still a child of the devil in that you're doing his will. It's his will that you should hate, for instance, black Christians. So now apply the case to Islam. I'm sorry, but I still think it's pretty clear like the missionaries typically believe, that the God of Islam is the God of Abraham. They're talking about the same being. They're claiming that that God and not someone else sent Muhammad. So their official God is God. It's Yahweh, whom they refer to as Allah, the God, or just God. Who's their actual God? Whose will are they actually doing? Well, you may think to some extent they're doing God's will, but of course, all of Islamic law is shaped by the Quran and the Hadith, the sayings and deeds that tradition attributes to Muhammad. Christians believe that there's a clash between the will of Muhammad and the will of God. And so, to some extent, a Muslim's actual God could be the one whose will they're doing could be Muhammad or spiritual forces that are behind Muhammad. It just depends what their attitudes are and what their actions are. But could there be a Muslim who is a God-fearing person? It would seem so. Could there be a Muslim who, to a large extent, is avoiding the things in Islamic tradition that are against God's will? It would seem so. Again, consider a Muslim who is starting to consider Christianity and who's interacting with Christian arguments and reading the Bible and trying to decide whether they want to accept Jesus as trumping the claims of Muhammad. 
Suppose this person is truly repentant, truly humble, and really seeking the truth. Could this person be to a large extent following God's will so that their official God is their actual God? It would seem so. You might say, well, yeah, but if that's fully the case, a person would convert. Well, yeah, maybe, but it seems there can be a match or a mismatch between one's official God and one's actual God. And that could be in the case of some strange, unusual religion. It can be so when it comes to mainstream Christianity. And it looks like it could be the case when it comes to mainstream Islam. When the Trinity's podcast returns, some more commentary from Dr. McGrew. Later in Dr. McGrew's piece, she seems to think that the clash comes down to this. And in this sense, her piece is similar to the one by Mr. Nabil Qureshi that I commented on in the last episode. She seems to think that Christians are just emphasizing the differences between the two theologies, and Muslims are emphasizing the common ground between the two theologies, and that's just all that's going on. Well, we say Trinity is important. Well, we say just the basic theistic attributes like omniscience and omnipotence are important. She says, quote, Why is the fact that Allah, as conceived in Islam, is the creator more important to the question at hand than the fact that he cannot be triune or incarnate, end quote. Well, I doubt that that analysis goes deep enough. You can't just consider degree of similarity or compare the differences with the similarities and just ask which one is more important. As she suggested earlier, I would say that it matters whether or not a person is actually interacting, actually responding to God's outreach. It's not solely a function of how you're thinking. Skipping a bit, she says this, quote, Finally, there's the what about the Jews argument. This is often trotted out as a knockdown response to any mention of the Trinity in this context, end quote. So if you try to argue that they can't be talking about the same God because they don't believe in the Trinity, are you going to say the same thing about the Jews, that they're not talking about the same God because they don't believe in the Trinity? That seems absurd. It is a central Christian claim that Christians are worshiping the same God that was talked about in the Jewish Bible, in the Christian Old Testament. This is her answer. Quote, In one sense, Christians and modern religious Jews worship the same God. In another sense, they don't. Old Testament Jews, of course, didn't reject the Trinity and the Incarnation since those doctrines hadn't been revealed. If one emphatically rejects these truths about God, however, and explicitly worships God as non-triune and non-incarnate, then this makes a pretty good case that, in one sense, such a person does not worship the same God whom Christians worship. End quote. I suggest that Dr. McGrew should interact a little bit more with Christians who are called Biblical Unitarians, also sometimes called Christian monotheists or One God Christians. People like us reject that God is tripersonal and also the classical incarnation doctrine, and we are most surely worshiping the same God, as is discussed in the New Testament, and the same God that many of us used to worship when we were Trinitarians who believed in the incarnation. So I don't think that just rejecting the Trinity and incarnation means that one does not worship the same God. It means there's a theological disagreement afoot. She continues, quote, In another sense, however, Christians can say to modern religious Jews, The true God who called your forefathers out of the land of Egypt, who gave the law at Sinai, who chose you as his beloved chosen people, really is the one who sent Yeshua the Messiah to die for our sins. We worship the God who really did found Judaism thousands of years ago, who really did give the Torah, and we are here to tell you more about him. In this historical sense, we can say the God we worship is the God of the Jews, Though those who haven't accepted Jesus don't, of course, agree. But notice, nothing like this is true in Islam. And then skipping a bit, there is no real historical connection in the acts of God himself between the Allah of Islam and the one true God. But there is a real historical connection in the acts of God between Judaism and Christianity. End quote. I would object to Dr. McGrew that this is a real historical act of God. As Paul discusses in Romans 1, making knowledge of himself possible through the natural world. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse, for though they knew God, but did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. It's pretty easy for anybody anywhere in the world to refer to the Creator. And clearly there was some influence, probably in various degrees indirect, between Christian sources, Christian people, and the views of Muhammad. So there were some historical connections of a sort. Did they have to do with the acts of God himself? Well, Christians don't believe that God founded Islam, no, but Christians do believe that God made it easy for people to refer to the creator of the heavens and the earth. And there's nothing about Islamic tradition that makes that reference impossible. She finishes like this, The question of whether Christians and Muslims worship the same God is a theologically deep question of immense practical importance. If Muslims and Christians worship the same God, then Muslims already worship the true God, they just worship him imperfectly and believe false things about him. How could this not have practical implications? It has daily relevance for missionaries to Muslims who must decide what to say on precisely this matter. It's relevant to whether Christians and Muslims can get together and all pray to Allah in an interfaith service, and is relevant right now to the administrators of Wheaton College. It's not surprising then that it can't be decided by a flick of the philosophical wrist. Ultimately, it comes down to what importance we give to particular attributes of the true God and to historical truths about his acts. Which ones do we treat as definitional of the notion of the God we worship? There's no reason to think philosophical specialists have any inside scoop on that question. End quote. Well, I agree with that last bit. What philosophers are good at is making careful distinctions and evaluating arguments and treating different arguments differently. She's assuming that the practical relevance of this question is that people will minimize the differences between Christianity and Islam. Well, not according to my uncle, not according to a lot of missionaries and a lot of older generation evangelicals. Why isn't it an important practical implication that Christians now have a stepping stone, a route in to talk religion with their Islamic neighbors, to compare prophets, to compare revealers of God, to compare books? to compare practices. Does it follow that people should pray to Allah with Muslims? You might think it depends on the context. A lot of people would say that you should not, as a Christian, participate in traditional Islamic prayers. Would you pray with an Islamic friend who was deciding whether or not to convert to Christianity? If this friend insisted on referring to God as Allah, and who as of that moment still retains Muslim confession and Muslim practice? I think I would do that. I don't think that would imply any equality between the two traditions. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Dr. Fazer and Dr. McGrew for their very interesting and stimulating pieces on the One God Controversy. Today's thinking music has been the track Ophelia's Song by Grapes. There's a link where you can listen to or download this track at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. We got a new review on iTunes this week. We got a five-star review in the iTunes store for New Zealand from a user named Medial Eyes. This user says, quote, Trinities is an excellent podcast of rare quality. Tuggy does an excellent job in preparing interesting topics. He also sources a wide variety of great guests and asks them all the right questions. 
He gets straight to the point and delivers excellent content with a friendly and humble attitude. The podcast occasionally ventures into theological issues that are not really relevant to the central topics of Christology, pneumatology, and paterology. Though this is disappointing, the tangential content remains a high quality. This podcast includes a variety of different voices for quotations and narrations. I presume Tuggy does this to break it up a bit and infuse some character. However, this is my biggest problem with the podcast. The voices often have strong accents or are read in an unusual manner. Because of this, I sometimes find it difficult to understand what is being said, let alone reflect on it, or I find it cringeworthy and off-putting. Besides, I enjoy Tuggy's clear and monotonous university professor-style voice." End quote. Thank you for that positive yet honest piece of feedback. I admit that not all of the readers that I've used have been of the highest quality. Sometimes I've been forced to go with inferior ones because of time constraints. I do tend to go for people who have a native accent. I don't think people are good at faking accents. Even actors are really terrible at faking accents most of the time, and I'm a sucker for accents. So, sorry, I know they're not all of the best quality, and I do hope I can work in some Kiwi accents into a future episode. If you'd like to leave a review in the iTunes store for your country, there are some instructions about how you can do this at trinities.org slash blog slash review. Also, don't forget, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Google+, or even Tumblr. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.